We must stand on the shoulders of giants. We should take note of the paths that others have created for us to learn from and to grow from. My name is Yupari, and in this week's video, we will be utilizing the Zorn palette to produce a John Singer Sargent master copy of the artist Claude Monet. For the materials today, I will be using Flake White Replacement, Cadmium Red Light, Yellow Ochre, and Ivory Black, and I do not think that any particular brand needs to be used as long as it is artist grade oil paint and the brushes for the majority of the painting will be synthetic brushes and for the mediums today to the left of my cup here i have a regular odorless mineral spirits and to the right i have a one fifth stand oil mixture to four fifths odorless mineral spirits mixture the way i create that mixture is I first find a container, notice the one in the middle, and then I subdivide it into five parts, notice the blue line on the bottom. That is the bottom one-fifth portion of the container. I fill it up to the blue line with stand oil and fill the rest of the container with odorless mineral spirits. And then I just shake up the container until it's completely mixed and that's it. That's how I create my one-fifth stand oil to four-fifths paint thinner mixture. Here is the original painting that Sargent created of Monet. And what an experience would it have been to see this painting develop in action. Two giants of the art world together. Monet, the impressionist, Sargent, the portraitist of the day. Could you imagine what that would have been like? Let's get into some of the colors. Now, I did create a Zorn palette painting. That is a painting created utilizing the Zorn palette previously in another video. So if you'd like to see that video, I'll leave a link in the description to that one. But what I learned from creating that painting was that from the Zorn palette, I think it's a really good idea to create your orange and your green and your burnt umber right away. So what I did was with the palette knife I combined my cadmium red light and the yellow ochre together uh, around equal parts to create that orange and then I utilized just a little bit of ivory black to a good amount of yellow ochre here to create a green. So what happened was after I created that Zorn palette painting from my previous video, I, I realized, man, I really should have mixed up some colors beforehand instead of trying to do it all with that brush. Now, a palette knife is pretty easy to clean, and it, it's really nice for creating uh, nice, clean, and rich colors. So I'm going to utilize it here to mix up my burnt umber. And burnt umber to me, I, I believe it to be a kind of uh, neutral, dark, warm color. And so I'm going to mix up the cadmium red light with the yellow ochre, uh, but more cadmium red light than yellow ochre, and then add a little bit of ivory black. And so let's, uh, let's think about it as perhaps 40% uh, yellow ochre and 50% cadmium red light, and 10% ivory black. Ivory black is a pretty dominating color on its own. So if I add a little too much ivory black to this mixture, it will go very dark very fast. And um, I don't quite have that 10% ivory black in it yet. And so I'm going to add a little bit more ivory black to this mixture and mix it up as well as I can with the palette knife. Remember the palette knife is a pretty good tool to mix up clean and rich colors, but the reason I don't use it too much in my painting videos is that it utilizes a lot of paint and it takes a lot of time to mix up, but I will utilize this palette knife nonetheless because I do like uh, having these rich mixtures. It almost looks like dark chocolate mixed onto the palette. Getting started here to the top left corner of your screen you will be seeing the original painting by John Singer Sargent throughout the entire video. 
And I will be using that burnt umber mixture that I created before as my drawing color. And for my drawing brush, I will be using a size 2 Filbert bristle brush. And the reason that I'm using the bristle brush is because it can make a very definitive mark and it can hold a lot of paint. And in the beginning of any portrait painting, I really like to let the brush run free. Now what I'm trying to do is establish my outside extremities, my outside shape. So I have a topmost area, a bottommost area, and I have a diagonal line for where I think that the shoulder is going to go. But everything is kind of still in flux here. Uh, notice how the brush is just moving wildly across the canvas. I'm just trying to feel my way around, keeping myself at approximately an arm's length away from the painting. So I try to stay as far back from the painting as possible. And that's kind of something that Mr. Sargent utilized himself. Uh, there's stories of him standing back so often that he would wear out the carpet in his studio. And now that is an overtold story, but hey, I'm going to tell it again. Uh, so now in any case, I'm going to start off by indicating the tear ducts. That's that triangular looking thing into the right side of the surface. And then I'm going to make a little mark across and try to map out where I think that the bottom extremity of the nose is going to be. So all we have at the moment is a basic shape indicating where I think that the entire structure of the head is going to go. That triangular looking structure for the eye socket. Now I said it was the tear duct earlier and I was getting ahead of myself. It is a structure for the eye socket. And there's a little diagonal line on that triangle that is indicating where I think the tear duct is going to go. But for the entire eye, I try to uh, not think about the actual pupil or the iris or anything like that in the beginning. Just a simple shape mapping out where the structure of the eye is going to go. And then just a little line here for the top of the eye. And utilizing a horizontal line, I see that the top of the eye is going to be almost plumb with the ear. So what does plumb mean? Plumb means that it matches up on a vertical or a horizontal axis. And in this case, the top of the eye is matching up plumb to the top of the ear. And so the basic idea with the way that I'm starting this painting is that I'm trying to be loose and I'm trying to be free with it because a portrait painting can carry a lot of weight both intellectually and mentally in terms of the fact that we are painting a human being and we want to think about them as human beings we don't want to object oh we don't want to objectify people we don't want to think of people as still lives or anything like that um, and that's what makes it kind of difficult to paint a portrait is that we have to think of them as still lives, but they're people. So and it, it's a very difficult place to be in in the beginning. I think there's a psychological tendency uh, whenever we're painting portrait, especially whenever I'm painting portrait, to try to do the best that I can to complement the model and not make something so uh, ghastly or something so horrifying to look at. But it is important to know that we are going to have to be treating this as a series of simple shapes just like you would with a still life just like you would with a landscape just think of it as a series of simple shapes and if you don't have a lot of experience with still life or landscape hey that's all right it's just a bunch of shapes connecting and relating to one another now as far as the shapes are concerned for the eye socket i basically have a triangle within a triangle a basic triangle for the side view of the eye socket and another triangle for where the placement of the eye is going to go but no detail just that and it matches up horizontally with the ear and the ear is almost a rectangular shape with a little L looking thing there for the helix of the ear and the entire head can be mapped out in just a few straight lines as you can see the bottom of the nose relative to the eye is a distance that is comparable to the top of the forehead to the eye. What do I mean by that? So the top of the 
eye socket, kind of where you think that the eyebrows are, is kind of a halfway point between the top of the forehead and the nose. So that is how I'm relating the spaces to one another. Now the top of the forehead to the eyebrows is a distance that is a little bit longer than that of the top of the eyebrows to the nose. But I'm simplifying it down into those basic relations in my head. So again, let's look at the basic shapes that are going on in my head. And so I have a basic shape for the outside of the head, and then I have a relation between the ear and the middle of the head. And so what I mean is that the ear is kind of in the middle of the head. Now remember that the head is in profile. Uh, so with the Sargent painting, that ear, if you look at the ear, look at the photo reference, the ear is almost in the center but it is a little bit to the left of the picture. Just a little bit to the left. And so that kind of conversation that goes on in your head, just a little to the left, or that the, uh, the ear is plumb on a horizontal with the top of the eye, meaning that the top of the ear matches up on a horizontal axis with the top of the eye. That kind of conversation is how we relate shapes to one another. And you could say that I'm using comparative measurement. I've heard that term now. I'm not using sight size, meaning that I don't have the picture right next to uh, the photo reference of the Sargent painting. Rather, I'm comparing each shape to one another. And the last measurement that I haven't talked about is the bottom of the nose is actually a little bit higher up than the bottom of the ear on a horizontal axis. So the ear and the bottom of the nose, that is the bottom of the ear and the bottom of the nose are not plumb. The bottom of the nose is a little bit higher. And so with my palette knife, I just mixed up a nice dark value for the dark mass of the hair, but I don't want to go straight black with this. And on your computer screen, it may look straight black, but I assure you it is not straight black. And so now I'm switching into my synthetic brushes. Now I'm going to use my synthetic brush just to cover the dark masses of the hair. And another technical tip that I should talk about that I have been learning through experience is that you want to use the least amount of medium with your darks as possible. So that dark mass of the hair has very little to no medium, just paint on its own. So let's keep that in mind. And the reason being is that if you use a lot of medium with your darks, when it dries, it dries a little bit um, kind of opaque looking or kind of... Uh, fog looking like so the darks look kind of fog and that's okay you can just put a retouch varnish and you get your values back just fine uh, but just a little technical tip there try to use the least amount of medium possible for the dark shapes of the hair and of course the same can be said throughout the entire painting uh, but just to be more practical i would say beware of using too much medium onto the dark shapes themselves and so now, using my palette knife, I mixed up another dark value for the coat that Monet is wearing. And I'm using the same brush, so it's pretty much going to be almost the same exact color and value as the beard. Uh, but I do perceive it to be a little bit on the cooler side than the beard, but not very much. And so I really like to work from the darks to the lights, and I'll explain a little bit on that uh, later. But what I'm doing right now is I'm mixing up a gray, uh, utilizing just my ivory black and the titanium white. It creates a nice cool color. Let's not think of it as just gray, but let's think of it more on the blue side. And so now I'm going to mix on the bottom, I'm going to be mixing a... Uh, another burnt umber type color similar very similar to the burnt umber and this mixture I'm creating is going to be intended for that background color uh, now the background color on the original painting is very hard to gauge from the photo reference 
um, essentially the entire color scheme of the painting is hard to gauge from photo reference. So if I were to uh, have this painting in front of me in person, that would probably be better. Uh, but hey, let's do what we can with the photo reference in terms of color. So it seems to be kind of on the brown side, but not warm, hot brown. It is a little bit more gray brown. So I'm using um, that kind of gray, warm, cool uh, methodology in my head and mixing it up uh, with the palette knife. And then now I'm going to be using my size 10 flat synthetic to uh, put that value onto the background. And so now what I'm going to do with my palette knife, I'm actually going to mix up a flesh tone. And that flesh tone is going to be derived from me blurring my eyes uh, looking at the reference. Now blurring your eyes can be done in many, many ways, of course. Uh, but I'm nearsighted, so I wear glasses. So what I'm doing is I'm actually putting my glasses down and looking at the photo reference. And then looking back at the canvas, or sorry, then looking back at the palette and trying to recreate just a flat spot of color that I think encompasses the entire color spectrum of the Sargent painting into just one blob, if you will, of color. And what that mixture is to me, of course, you can see the entire mixture happen on the right side of the screen but what I believe that I used was an orange first and then with a little bit of white created an orange pink I hope you can follow along so orange then orange pink and then I'm gonna be utilizing that gray that I mixed to the right but I added some more yellow ochre to that gray to create a neutral green not quite as green as mixing the two together the uh, yellow ochre and ivory black together but just a little bit of a gray green and I'm gonna put that into the orange pink and so I'm gonna be neutralizing it and bringing the value up a little bit with the, the the white the flake white replacement and remember flake white is a lead white which is a transparent white and I'm gonna put some of the paint that's on the palette knife on the bottom just so I don't uh, waste that paint by cleaning the palette knife and so with a little scrubber uh, this little scrubbing brush it is a size one fairly beat up round synthetic brush and uh, putting it onto the painting itself I noticed that it's way high in value uh, but that's okay I'm gonna utilize that mixture now to help me create the other flesh tone mixtures so now let's talk about uh, moving from dark to light. Now the technique that I'm going to be using in this painting is a technique that I utilized in my video on form and structure. And if you haven't seen the form and structure video, I will uh, leave a link to that video in the description below as well. And so what I did with that video was I first created a drawing which is what you saw me create and explain earlier just a simplified drawing and then I went and rendered uh, from the forehead down and so a way that can be done is to work uh, I believe is to work from dark to light and so I'm putting in just a basic flesh tone that I have in the past called a false color so I have placed the false color on the forehead just a uh, generic uh, dark warm flesh tone that I can use to construct more of the uh, colors and planes on top of. And so what happens is when you layer light values on top of darker values, <clears throat> lighter values on top of dark values, it creates that gradation uh, in a much more simple way. Uh, now I am going to be mixing up value for value. I'm not going to try to blend uh, too much, but the way that I'm going to be applying uh, my layers of color is that I'm going to be constructing lighter and lighter planes onto the forehead and build them and herd them 
kind of like herding sheep, herding them closer and closer to the lighter regions of the forehead, being uh, the regions receiving the most amount of light. Now the important thing to note here is that the rendering and the gradation of the values on the forehead is not a generic Mr. Potato Head. It is more flat on the side of the forehead, that region just above and to the left of the eyebrows or the eye socket. And so by looking at the forehead and trying to analyze it, I see that it is more flat closer to the side, the left side relative to the picture of the eyebrows. It is more flat in that area and it starts to round out or curve away from us as we get closer and closer to the top of the hair. The topmost region of the forehead is curving away from us. And even the side of the forehead is curving away from us. And so I'm not really too worried about the outline of the side of the forehead uh, hopefully I'll be able to come back in with another brush like I'm doing right now with the top of the forehead and further articulate the actual outline of the side of the forehead. But right now I'm prioritizing uh, the values, the gradation of the values across the side of the forehead. So let's talk about form and curvature of the form. And so for the top of the forehead, as I mentioned earlier, this area is curving away from us at a much faster rate. So the rate of curvature on the top of the forehead is a much faster curve than the curve on the side of the face to the left side of the eye socket. So a slow curve has a very gentle gradation of values, almost imperceptible, and a fast curve as a very fast gradation of values, meaning that we're going from the light of the forehead to progressively darker as we approach the hair at a much faster rate. It's much more noticeable than the side of the face to the left side of the eye socket. Now let's talk about the flesh tone colors themselves. So now that we talked a little bit about the gradation of values on the forehead, let's talk about the colors themselves. So it looks like um, relative to that photo reference, uh, or should I say according to that photo reference, that the forehead is much more on the warmer yellow side than say the region around the nose. And the region around the nose is much more on the pink or uh, red side than say an area like the hair. Uh, so now let's relate these shapes of color to one another. Think of them as spots of color. So we isolate the color of the forehead in relation to the color of the nose. And this can be done in a much more simple way if we blur our eyes and just look at the blurred image of the picture. And so we notice that the top region closer to uh, the forehead and the side of the left area of the eye socket is more on the yellow side and we get warmer closer to the orangey pink closer to the nose. And then as we progress towards the hair, uh, we get darker and cooler colors. And of course, uh, the neck or the bottom of the ear is much more on the darker pink orangey side. So now as I work my way across the, the face, I'm going to be using my little scrubber here to put in that false color that I was talking about, that dark warm flesh tone. And I'm going to be utilizing very small amounts of paint and very small amounts of medium, almost no medium. And the reason I'm going to do this, and I'm going to wipe some of it off actually on the side just to make it even more thin. The reason I'm doing that, of course, is to facilitate the application of the further layers of paint. So as I move up in uh, the painting, as I progress in the painting, I'm going to be adding more and more paint and I'm going to be building uh, the forms and building the colors together. So this 
area right here to the left of the eye socket that I've been talking about is much more yellow, much more on the yellow side relative to the areas that we talked about before. So this area is more yellow and it's also receiving more light. So I'm going to be using much more paint in this area. So what I'm doing is I'm focusing on each individual plane that I can perceive. And remember a plane is just a simplified concept of a three-dimensional uh, supposed flat sheet of paper in a three-dimensional area. So it's pretty much just a flat sheet or a flat region in three-dimensional space and that plane has a specific angle to the light. Now this area right here that I just painted is a plane that is facing the light more than all of the planes around it. So it is a high lit region and it is most perpendicular to the light source and the shadows are going to be most parallel, completely parallel to the light source so that they will be completely in shadow. And of course I'm not painting this uh, from life though it would be amazing to be painting with Mr. Sargent himself in the company of Claude Monet. I very much wish I was there painting with him. But I'm trying to imagine in my head Mr. Sargent's studio and where that light is coming from. The angle of that light. Now Sargent himself would have probably put in an entire flat value for the entire face and then sculpted out the planes from there. But of course I can't know because I don't have any any kind of uh, unfinished paintings of his or any kind of way of knowing how he constructed this painting. Uh, but I do believe that he, since he was trained by uh, Carlos Duran, who was a uh, predominant teacher in his time, taught his students uh, to just go in with value and construct everything uh, three-dimensionally with large shapes of value and color. So I believe that's kind of how uh, Mr. Sargent created this himself rather than creating a uh, pencil drawing and then transferring it and all that. Though uh, Sargent did draw for his larger figures and his, of course, uh, more involved paintings with multiple figures he did draw uh, onto his canvas before he laid out his colors. I know that much for sure. Uh, and the reason I know that is from teachers telling me before, so if I'm wrong it's because my teachers told me that. But in any case, I'm going to be treating each area of the painting kind of like an a la prima portrait, uh, meaning Alla prima means done in one sitting or all at once, meaning each area that I'm painting here, I'm trying to paint it to a finish. And I think it's much more, uh, it's much more simple for me to explain it um, as I go. Each plane that I'm painting, uh, notice this light plane right here uh, on the top ridge of the uh, eye socket that area right there is receiving a lot of light and that is a very sharp edge and I think Sargent probably left that edge pretty sharp uh, so that it can be more of a focal point so that it would draw your eye into this area of the painting first. He wanted you to see Monet's eyes first so he must have left that value or that edge much more sharp for that reason but again I can only suppose so with each area of paint that I'm applying, I'm considering the areas surrounding it. So this area right here is darker and it's curving away from the light. And so is this area here. The area between the eye and the eyebrow. That area is a darker value than say the areas above the eyebrow. But not that much darker. It's not in shadow, but it is darker relative to the surrounding areas. And now as we move here onto um, the actual eyebrow itself, it is very dark. It is fairly dark, kind of like the hair. And then I'm going to match that dark with the 
dark of the shape of the eye. And I'm gonna just use a simple shape here, simple dark shape for the dark of the eye. Now it may look frightening in the beginning, uh, but I've found that with eyes, if I just put in a dark mass of color somewhat in the shape of the eye itself that I'm going to paint, uh, then it becomes much easier for me uh, to construct the lighter values on top of that darker value. And with each individual shape of color and value, I'm also relating the distances to one another. And so I'm thinking of uh, maintaining the top of the eye plumb on a horizontal axis relative to the ear. Remember that means that I'm trying to maintain the eye as perfectly horizontal to the top of the ear as possible because that's how it is on the painting. They're very, very close to being plumb on a horizontal axis. Remember plumb means that they match up on a vertical or a horizontal axis. And so now as I move along the painting, I'm constructing darker shapes here as we roll across the side of this entire structure beneath of the eye. It's receiving more light as we approach uh, the left corner of the eye. The left corner of the eye, if you notice, is receiving more light than this area here. This area here is turning further away from the light, so it's receiving less light. Uh, but here's the catch. This area, though it's receiving less light and it's turning away from us, is not as dark as, say, the dark values uh, as we approach the top of the hair. So I'm going to have to gradate the values now by adding lighter values on top of the darker values that I just added. So notice now how I'm going to start to add the lighter values onto the bottom area of the left side of the eye. Applying the lighter values on top of the darker values allows me to create each individual shape and maintain that transition of values to create that three-dimensional construction that I'm trying to make. And so the area above closest to the left side of the eye is much lighter. It's facing the light more and as we roll across the side here, this area is receiving more light as well, but it's not receiving as much light. So I'm relating those two values to one another. And at the same time, I'm thinking of the color, it's much more on the pinkish side, the orangey pinkish side. And I'm going to follow through on the other side of the eye in this area over here. It is a value that is darker than, say, the side of the eyebrow, that highlight region we were talking about. This area is darker than that. So that should be... Uh, that should be noted first. And then I have to compare that value to the surrounding values. So when looking at shapes of color and value, they are either going to be darker than or lighter than their surrounding values, or they're going to be warmer than or cooler than their surrounding values. And then of course there's the whole thing of hues. Uh, so hues being that the forehead of course is more on the yellowish hue, and then the side of the face closest to the nose is going to be more on the more orangey pinkish hue. And so let's compare this shape of color that I'm painting right now to the shape uh, to the left of it. So this area that I'm filling in here is more on the lighter side than the shape to the left. So this plane here is receiving more light than the area of the face to the left. So I'm kind of thinking of this uh, in a two-dimensional kind of sense. Now I usually emphasize the three-dimensionality of the picture, but sometimes it's more simple to think about it in a two-dimensional way. Let's think of it as a puzzle and not a portrait. So how does each individual puzzle piece fit relative to the surrounding puzzle pieces? And as we gauge the pieces relative to one another and place them down, 
Um, that is only our initial guess. That is only our initial instinct. Uh, so let's not try to paint by numbers, but try to paint by intuition a little bit here. And so uh, by intuition, intuitively, I see that the forehead uh, needs to be much more on the warmer side. So I'm going to be using the palette knife here to mix up a nice pink. And then I'm going to use this uh, pinkish hue uh, to help me facilitate the transition of values on the forehead. So remember that area that was much more on the yellow side. Uh, it is on the yellow side and it is receiving more light, but as it gradates around the forehead, um, and I'm talking about the area just above the eyebrow. So if you're lost with the area I'm talking about, it's the area just above the top of the eyebrow. That area is uh, on my painting a little bit too blue, a little bit too cool. And so I'm going to be now adjusting it here uh, with more of a warmer transition of color and a little bit uh, lighter in value as well. So using, using this pink here to transition that area. And then I'm going to apply it, just the pink itself, uh, to the nose. Remember the nose, the area of the nose is a little bit uh, more on the orangey pinkish side in terms of hues and the value itself is a little bit lighter. That little triangle of light that I just painted right here is a little bit lighter than the region to the left. That shape to the left of it, that puzzle piece if you will, is just a little bit darker and it's a little bit lighter as we approach the top of the nasal bone. This area right here is receiving just a little bit more light. And then there's going to be an area to the right side of that dark mass of the eye, this little area right here. This area is going to be receiving more light as well. It's going to be facing the light more, um, but remember, let's just think of it as a, a two-dimensional thing for the moment here. We're just comparing values to one another and colors to one another. And as we add these shapes, or as I add these shapes, I'm also aware of the drawing, as in the physical placement of the shapes in relation to one another. This value right here to the bottom of the eye is receiving uh, less light, uh, but not too much so it's not terribly dark and it's also a sharper edge so the way that I'm gonna create a sharper edge right here is to just place more force onto the application of paint itself and then with that same paint on my brush I'm gonna use it to just pull out uh, a little bit of light here uh, for the small indications of light that exists on the actual sergeant painting itself just a little bit uh, just a little touch of light there and now with my little scrubbing brush I'm gonna set the stage if you will uh, for the values for the nose and so utilizing that uh, idea of a false color that I was talking about before meaning that it's a darker and warmer color from which I can construct the other colors on top of so this is pretty much setting up the stage now uh, for the values that I'm going to utilize to create the nose. All it is is relating shapes. All we're doing is relating shapes. All of painting is pretty much relating shapes. All of portrait painting is pretty much relating shapes and not getting too caught up with the fact that we're painting a human being. And so I'm going to place this dark, warm, uh, triangular looking uh, region here. And the reason I'm going to be um, painting this dark, warm value here and then a lighter value here is I'm constructing the entire volume of the nose uh, with just simple shapes. And I, with the nose, I like to start off with kind of just a flat shape. That is a flat shape that's a little bit warmer and darker, perhaps even more than the surrounding areas. Um, and then adding on the lighter values and then adding on the shapes, of course, for the bulb of the nose, the wing of the nose, and the nostril. Uh, but we'll get more into that. And so with this brush here, I'm just trying to carve out again a more specific shape uh, for the outside of the, uh, the outside shape of the face in this area here. And I'm also trying to sharpen that edge a tad bit as well. 
And now I'm going to mix, be mixing up a nice and dark warm color, very similar to that of the beard, perhaps even a little bit darker, but I don't want it to go jet black. Uh, and the reason for that is anything that is uh, straight white or straight black tends to jump out. And I really don't want anything to jump out too much, even though the dark for the nostril here is fairly dark. And uh, if I analyze the photo reference of the painting, it's pretty much straight black. But I really don't think that uh, Sargent himself painted the dark of the nostril straight black. I don't think he ever did that or anything like that. And so the reason that the photo reference, this area of the nostril might look straight black is perhaps just because uh, the way the photograph is taken. Um, but in any case, the dark of the nostril is receiving the least amount of light, therefore it's going to be one of the darkest areas uh, of the face, this area right here. But it's not, I'm not making it straight black. So remember, I'm relating uh, values to one another in my head, and uh, I'm relating that dark of the nostril to the surrounding darks, say the dark of the uh, the eyes, the dark of the uh, the eyebrows, they're pretty much optically they're straight black but they are not. Just a little bit lighter. Notice the brush in this clip right now. Notice the blue tape. Now notice this brush. It looks very similar but it doesn't have the blue tape. So what's going on here? Uh, so what I'm doing is, throughout the entire painting, I'm actually keeping uh, different brushes for different tasks for the painting. And so for this small size one round brush, I'm actually uh, keeping a light brush and a dark brush. And so this light brush, I'm utilizing it uh, for the flesh tone mixtures, the lighter values. And then the darker brush, I'm utilizing it for areas such as the uh, the dark of the nostril, um, the outside shape of the face, because I can use it to map out the outline of the side of the face itself. Alright, so back to the shapes. So what am I doing? I painted in that dark value for the nostril, and then I blasted it out with my flesh tones. Why did I do that? So the reason is that I'm trying to figure out the drawing, the shape of the nose itself. I'm trying to get the shape correctly. If you can get the shape right, then you can adjust the value. Now if you can figure out what the value is, then you can really uh, do some stuff with color. And so I'm still trying to carve out that shape, uh, this little shape here for the side of the nose, uh, utilizing my dark brush. I'm uh, very carefully trying to figure out that shape, but at the same time I was raising up the value uh, for the entire nose itself. So figuring out that shape first was important to me, uh, and then adjusting the value, knowing that that value for the side of the nose was lighter. It is lighter than the surrounding areas of the face, say the values to the left side of the face. So the values to the left of the nose are a little bit lighter than the nose itself because they are catching less light than the nose. And so I'm going to be constructing uh, those values. And now I'm going to be applying a color difference. Uh, so this area of the wing of the nose is warmer. It's closer to uh, the red ish side. It's warmer, so I adjusted that value, but it's also darker. So I utilized both the value and the color with a single brush stroke, creating that volume for the wing of the nostril, which I'm sure is something that Sargent tried to do. Well, of course, it's something that Sargent did and something that I'm trying to do. And then I went ahead and painted in uh, some lighter regions for the nose. These areas here are picking up more light. Notice this area here is going to be much lighter. It's going to be picking up much more light. I'm going to be adding a second plane here now for the curvature of the wing of the nose. Just a little uh, brush stroke here uh, to indicate the wrapping of the wing of the nose around the side.
And now we're going to relate the bottom of the nose, this area here, is comparable to the top of the nose, meaning that their values are very similar and I can almost not tell them apart. So I'm going to be uh, painting this value directly beneath the wing of the nostril, pretty much in the same value family as this area here, uh, to the top of the nose that is receiving a lot of light as well. And then I'm going to be working the shape of the beard. Of course I like to work uh, with my shapes side to side relative to one another. And so this shape of the beard here is actually uh, making more of an L, like a backwards L looking shape. And so there's another little trick here. Uh, so when you're working with shapes, try not to think of them as, say, beard. Uh, think of it as like a little L shape. It looks like an L shape. And it's an L shape that's wrapping a little bit further over here. So the bottom of the L is going to be somewhere over here. But then you can also think of it kind of like a mountain. Uh, so there are all kinds of mind games that you can use uh, to relate the shapes themselves to something else that you can identify them with. And so now back to my little scrubber. The little scrubber is a, remember, it's a pretty much a kind of beat up uh, size one round brush. And if you want to know exactly what brush this is, it is a Princeton Catalyst Polytip Bristle. And don't let the fancy name fool you. Any kind of synthetic uh, bristle mixture brush will do just fine. But in any case, uh, this area beneath of uh, the face as we approach the beard is darker. It is curving away from the light uh, pretty significantly, but I'm going to overstate it at first. So this right here is an approximation to the value that I want, but it's overstated. And the reason is uh, because, as I mentioned um, many times, that I want to start off a little bit darker and work my way up lighter and that is because once I build the values that I'm going to have I notice I'm starting to add one here once I build the lighter values on top of the darker values constructing them in that way in my opinion allows the development of the gradations of value to be uh, much more subtle say then uh, applying darker values on top of lighter values you oftentimes get pieces of lighter value w within the darker value uh, and that could be something that you might want to experiment on your own uh, cover a region of uh, canvas lighter and then try to gradate the values using dark and then try to uh, on another side of the canvas cover it dark and then try to create gradations of light uh, you'll see that it should be a little bit easier to go from dark to light. But that, of course, is personal preference. What matters is that you're paying attention to the shapes of value themselves. So the shape of this value right here to the bottom of the face, uh, pretty much the lowest part uh, as we approach the beard in relation to the surrounding areas, it's perhaps one of the darkest shapes and then as we move across up here it's going to get a little bit lighter uh, it's going to be lighter than say the closest part to the beard to the bottom uh, this area right here with my little scrubber I'm just going to fill it in now completely it this area right here is going to be receiving a little bit more light and I'm going to pull some of it out uh, with my paper towel and remember I'm just pulling some of the paint out just so that it remains fairly thin and so I pretty much set the stage now for the future values that I'm going to add uh, to build more of the volume of the face and so now with the palette knife I'm going to make a nice uh, more dark orange bright yellow mixture uh, hang in there with me so that value is going to be light and the hue is going to be more on the yellow orangey side. So this yellow orangey side, I'm going to be uh, applying that paint onto my size one round brush. Remember, I'm have I have a light brush and a dark brush. So this is the 
light brush and I'm going to use it to apply it here onto the side of the face where I perceive it to be lighter in value and a little bit more on the orangey side. And as we move across the side of the face uh, on our journey away from that highlight region, uh, we're crossing areas that are going to be darker. So this plane right here that I'm, that I'm painting is going to be darker and it's also going to be a little bit more on the warmer pinkish side. But even though it's darker, it's not going to be as dark as, say, uh, the value in between uh, the eyebrow and the top of the eye. So I'm relating these shapes to one another. And let's try to, let's try to create an analogy. Let's think of it not as a portrait, but rather as a puzzle. So let's think of it a little bit as a jigsaw puzzle. So with the jigsaw puzzle, first you want to figure out where the pieces fit together. And if you can figure out where the pieces fit together, it's just a matter of putting it together. So in, much in a way, with the painting, is trying to figure out where the pieces fit. Uh, so notice here it's going to be a little bit darker but more pink. So figure out where the pieces fit and then put it together. Uh, but it's not so simple because with a jigsaw puzzle you have to search for that puzzle piece. And it can take you, sometimes it can take you hours, it can take you days. It depends on what the complexity of that puzzle is. Notice as I start to build these shapes here, I'm thinking about the value, the relative values according to the shape. And so I'm thinking of the relative values, albeit that this plane here is lighter than the planes beneath it. So I'm thinking of the value and then I'm thinking about the hue. So the hue is more on the orangey pink. So kind of like when you're looking for a piece for a jigsaw puzzle when you're painting, you're looking for the placement of the shape, the value of the shape, and the hue of that shape relative to the surrounding shapes. So once you kind of have an idea of where that shape is going to go, then it's just a matter of placing it down. It's just a matter of placing down the paint. And just like in a jigsaw puzzle, if you place a piece in the wrong place, it is not the end of the day, unless of course you get angry and try to force it in there and break the piece. But in painting, much like a jigsaw puzzle, it is it's fairly forgiving. So if you place something in the wrong spot, then it, it's not the end of the world to correct it. Uh, so in this case, let's look at this value here as we get closer to uh, the wing of the nose. This value that I'm going to be working my way towards uh, is going to be a little bit less in the shape of a hook, but it's going to be more in the shape of a line. So uh, you can think of it kind of as a wrinkle. Uh, so I guess Monet must have had a, a wrinkle there, but it's all good. We, we all get wrinkles. So this area here is not in the shape of a hook. So I had it kind of curved like in the shape of a hook. So I'm going to just paint it out. Just remember, it's paint. You can push it around and it's very forgiving. Paint takes a long, oil paint takes a long time to dry. So it's fairly forgiving. So I just took it out completely and then I'm going to utilize the paint that's still on there to gradate these values like this. Adding lighter paint on top of lighter, uh, adding lighter paint on top of darker paint allows me to gradate, gradate these values much more simply. And now I'm going to come back with the darker brush here and then adding darker paint on top of lighter paint. Not ideally, it's not what I meant to do. Uh, but hey, a painting isn't supposed to be uh, developed all at once. Not every single brush stroke is gonna be that magical brush stroke that just makes things happen. You really have to work for it, or at least I really have to work for it. I really have to apply an area of paint, stand back, see if it fits, leave it be, come back only to find out it's wrong, and then change it relative to another area. So it's kind of that game, uh, take two steps forward, one step back kind of thing. 
Now we're back to my scrubber, and as you can imagine, we're going to be setting the stage for yet another set of values uh, to create the volume of yet another piece of this painting. And so uh, that area is going to be actually the side of the ear, of course, and I'm going to be using my paper towel to try and thin out the, uh, the paint and I use it a little bit more to take some of it off just so I have enough paint so that I can um, build my values on top of. Now let's talk about color in the portrait and somewhat of the fashion that Monet must have thought of when he painted his Impressionist landscapes. Um, so from what I've heard, Monet wanted to see the world anew in terms of not just values but colors and spots of colors relative to one another. He wasn't so worried about the fine finish of things. Monet wanted to get the effect of light. He wanted to get the temperature. He wanted to get the time of day on his paintings. And that was what Monet wanted to achieve. And if I'm wrong, I am sorry. That is what I perceive. That is what I think that Impressionism was, was to capture the effect of light, to capture the moment. That's what I have been told. That's what I've read. That's what I believe that Monet wanted to do and that the Impressionists wanted to do and that all of Impressionism is, is trying to capture that effect of light, utilizing color. Uh, but in any case, let's analyze the portrait using that kind of methodology. So first and foremost, let's think about, again, spots of color. So the area of the forehead to the left of the eyebrow is of course as I mentioned more on the yellowy side more on the yellow side and of course as we get closer to the nose it is more on the pinkish side very subtle pink and I think that the photo reference probably uh, it might overdo the pink I don't think Sargent painted it that pink as the photo reference is I did the best I could to find uh, the photo reference uh, the best photo reference I could find of this painting. I do not think Sargent painted it that warm, but it is nice that the photo reference is exaggerating uh, the warmth of the color a tad bit. So, spots of color. The area to the left of the beard, closest to the ear, is more on the orangey side. The areas closest to the nose are more on the pink side, and the areas of the forehead are more on the yellow side and it gets a little bit more red as we approach the ear. These are spots of color and I'm relating these spots of color relative to one another and I think that's the way that Monet perceived his landscapes was to paint the first impression of what he saw, the first impression of the spots of color relative to one another. Now I don't want to say that I know so much about color because I don't. I'm learning about it just like you. I've only been telling you things that I have been told by my previous teachers. And let's talk a little bit about, um, without getting too uh, mathematical, the order of operations of things in painting. And, I, and this might offend some people, and I'm so sorry if I offend you with this, but the development of form is the priority, in my opinion, in my opinion, when it comes to painting. The form and the drawing, in terms of relating shapes to one another and working out the values. Now, let's, uh, let's play a little game here. Let's look at the painting and the photo reference in black and white as we develop a little bit more on this ear. Notice that it all holds together and that it all kind of works out and it's working out because it is the development of the values relative to one another that creates the form. Now let's play another game. Let's look at the photo reference and the painting that I'm developing and let's completely change the colors. Let's get wacky with the colors. See? the painting still kind of holds. But how does that happen? It is because 
just from the physical nature of things that the application of values onto a two-dimensional surface alone is what develops the three-dimensionality of an image. And I'm not saying that color doesn't play any kind of role in it, because it does, but color itself should be utilized, in my opinion, to develop the effect of light, the relative temperature, the condition of the light, some people call it light key, uh, but whatever you call it, the development of the colors should be something about the actual quality of the light itself. So what that means is if you can really uh, figure out what your shapes are, where your shapes belong relative to one another, and what the value should be, and kind of what the relative colors are uh, in relation to one another, then you really have room to play around with the colors. Uh, and I, I, I encourage that. I encourage that you get out of your comfort zones once in a while. Uh, maybe put some purples in the shadows, some orange in the lights. Maybe do paint the still life outdoors in the sunlight with a, a lot of colors on your palette solely with the purpose of exploring what you can do with different colors. Don't, don't ever think that that is in its own. That on its own will not create form. And um, I, I, like I said, that can probably offend some people, but I find that color is a very beautiful thing to apply onto painting only after the fact that the values and the shapes can be worked out. Because once you figure out uh, how to work with the values uh, relative to one another and the shapes relative to one another, you really have a lot of room uh, to play around with the colors. And so now I've moved on to the side of the neck and I'm working from my darker values across to my lighter values and the curvature of the neck is a much faster curve than say the side uh, of the face closest to the left side of the eyebrow that I keep referring to. That area is much more flat so the gradations of values are much more flat. They're much more slow. You can barely notice the gradations of values on the side of the face to the left of the eyebrow. But look at the photo reference on the neck. Uh, you can see that the values are gradating much faster as we roll across the side of the neck because that is a much faster turn. And of course there is some uh, hair that Sargent painted um, probably to the bottom of uh, Monet's haircut. I think that's hair, those uh, darker brush strokes. But in any case, uh, there is a form, there is a volume of curvature that is curving at a very specific rate around the neck, much faster uh, than the areas closer to the forehead. And I'm using a larger brush for these mixtures. I'm using a size 4 Filbert Synthetic and it is a Gray Matters brush by uh, Jack Richardson, I believe. But in any case, don't worry about the brand. All it is is a size 4 Filbert synthetic brush. And I believe it's actually a synthetic bristle mix. So that is what the brush is. And I'm actually going to use some of the value of the hair uh, to allow me to create more of an edge here. And so I'm going to let the colors touch uh, to help me create a, create a gradation of value here that can also help me create an edge quality. So the edge of the division between this area of the beard is much softer. So now let's get on to the edge that is sharpest. The sharpest edge in the picture I think is right here, this little shape of the glabella. The glabella is the area right in between the two eye sockets and uh, with a single brush stroke I created that curvature and then with this fan brush, fan brush is just a brush used to fan out the paint to eliminate glare. I uh, just used it just to get rid of some of the glare. And now I'm going to be filling in the background color 
Um, I don't want to leave it too much like a vignette, uh, vignette meaning leaving areas unfinished. Now that can look very nice and lots of paintings, but with this one I want to flatten out the background almost entirely. I think the picture is painted in that way where the background is almost entirely flattened out. But as I start to add more values onto the background and to the shirt, notice this dark value I'm going to put on the shirt, I'd like to talk a little bit also about uh, the way that I approached this painting. So I did the initial sketch, the primary sketch, to figure out the placement of things, and then I started out uh, almost right away with the form modeling. I jumped right into the application of the planes onto the forehead. I noticed this nice, uh, this simple brush stroke here for the color. Lots of fun to paint. Uh, but in any case, I started out uh, with that area because it's a very uh, time-consuming thing. It takes a lot of thinking for me to figure out the values uh, of the face closest to the eyes and to the nose. The eyes and the nose uh, were the areas that I wanted to figure out as accurately as I could. And then, if anything goes wrong, I can easily adjust the forehead by making it shorter or making it taller. And then with the side of the face, it wasn't as complicated uh, to adjust the values closest to the neck. And so now returning to that focal point of the eye, I'm going to add just a simple value here, a smaller dark value here to create that gradation of value and to finish that curvature of form. So I started out with this area of the painting primarily in the beginning of the portrait because I knew that as I continued working, I would get more and more um, perhaps lenient, more and more tired, and so that's why I started out with this area first. Now I don't always work like that, and I don't always work in the same way. I like to explore different ways to do different kinds of things. And that little dark, uh, dark light is pretty much the last shape that I will be adding to this painting. So that pretty much wraps up this week's portrait painting demonstration. Thank you so much for watching. It was a lot of fun to paint this one. And hopefully it was a lot of fun for you to watch and to learn from creating a John Singer Sargent Master copy using the four color Zorn palette of none other than Monet. I'd like to thank you so much for watching this week's portrait painting demonstration. I hope it helps you out. And I wish you the best in all of your artwork. And of course, stay tuned for next week's portrait painting video. And if you'd like to see more of my paintings more often, please feel free to check out or follow my Instagram page, and I'll leave a link in the description below to that. Thanks again, and I hope you have a wonderful week.